So good to see you all here. So as some of you know, my name is Vanessa Loader. I am uh, the creator of VanessaLoader.com, and I'm the host of these virtual gatherings with the goal of bringing calm to COVID. You know, about a month ago, I was sitting in meditation and just kind of posing the question, how can I be of service during this time? It felt like what we were going through was really big, not just on an individual level, but on a collective level. And I wanted to um, offer something big in response to that. And so the idea that came through was to gather some of the world's leading wisdom teachers to help us uh, find ways to cope with the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty, and the grief that many people are experiencing right now. So we've been doing this for about five uh, or so. This might be the sixth week we're doing it. And once you're registered, you also have access to all of the recordings of the wisdom teachers who have been here live in the prior weeks. So be sure to watch those. Um, and we've you know, been going through different topics each week, depending on what you all have, have told us you're struggling with and what the different teachers are offering. So today, I'm really excited to talk to you about how can we start you know, finding even better ways to manage the fear, the grief, the uncertainty, and the anxiety, all of these difficult emotions that you might be experiencing. And what specifically, what does neuroscience and mindfulness, what do they have to offer that might help you? And some of you know me well, have been in this community for a while. To others, I might be new. So just to give you the two-second background, um, I worked in business for almost a decade, got my MBA from Stanford, and was working in private equity as an investor before I realized I was deeply unfulfilled by my career. And I started studying mindfulness and the neuroscience behind behavior change, originally just to manage my own anxiety, because I would lie in bed at night with my mind just racing, you know, feeling like I'd never gotten everything done that day that I wanted to get done. So I got into the world of mindfulness and neuroscience just for my own benefit. And I ended up changing so much that I quit my job, decided to start my own business, bringing these tools to other people, particularly to people in the business world. So that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And um, I have some really exciting practices and tools and meditations to share with you all today. So as I was thinking about what to talk about today. I've been listening to a lot of folks in the community and, you know, people are in a lot of pain, a lot of grief and fear. Other people feel like actually things are not that bad, but then I feel guilty because there's so many people in the world suffering and I'm kind of, I'm doing okay. You know, it's, yes, it's harder to get groceries and life has changed, but um, I'm not in extreme suffering. And yet I know this is happening to our planet right now and I feel kind of helpless. So there's a whole range, everything from grief to gratitude and everything in between that people are feeling. And, you know, one of the questions I've heard is how can we balance accepting how little control we have right now and yet not letting that acceptance turn into resignation? How do we watch the world and people we love suffer or suffer ourselves without going into despair or, you know, extreme fear, anxiety and grief all the time? Well, one of my favorite practices that I actually got from a mentor of mine, Jack Cornfield, is an equanimity meditation. And the reason I love this practice so much is because it helps you wish well for others while at the same time having kind of healthy boundaries with your heart, where, you know, if you're anything like me, I know I always want to go in and fix things for people and be the hero and offer solutions. It can be hard to sit with someone else's pain or suffering and feel really helpless. And equanimity is a really wonderful practice to sit with the pain or suffering that you have in your heart or that you see in the world without, in a way that works for you. So kind of welcoming it into your, your whole heart. So what I'd like to do today is start off with uh, an equanimity meditation. So what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and get in a comfortable seated position and if you have your legs crossed, I recommend uncrossing your legs, just resting your hands gently in your lap. And whenever you're ready and you're comfortable, allow your eyes to gently close. And I'd like to start by sharing a poem by John O'Donohue. It's called, For a New Beginning. In out-of-the-way places of the heart, 
where your thoughts never think to wander. This beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you are ready to emerge. For a long time, it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness growing inside you, noticing how you willed yourself on, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the gray promises that sameness whispered, heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent, Wonderful, would you, wondering, would you always live like this? Then the delight, when your courage kindled and out you stepped onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plenitude opening before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm for your soul senses the world that awaits you. Your soul senses the world that awaits you. And now as we go into this equanimity practice, continuing to rest with your eyes gently closed. Equanimity is a wonderful quality. It's a spaciousness and balance of heart. And although it grows naturally with meditation practice, equanimity can also be cultivated in the same systematic way that you may use for loving kindness or compassion. We can feel this possibility of balance in our hearts in the midst of life when we recognize that life is not in our control. We're a small part of this great dance. And even though you may cultivate tremendous compassion for others and strive to alleviate suffering in the world, there will still be situations that we are unable to affect. And in times like these, it can be helpful to remember the serenity prayer that says, may I have the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Wisdom recognizes that all beings are heir to their own karma, that each act that they each act and receive the fruits of their actions. We can deeply love others and offer them assistance, but in the end, they must learn for themselves. They must be the source of their own liberation. Equanimity combines an understanding mind together with a compassionate heart. So this practice comes directly from Jack Cornfield. So as you begin to cultivate equanimity, sitting in a comfortable, posture with your eyes remaining closed. Start by bringing a soft attention to your breath until your body and your mind are calm. Perhaps noticing the rise and fall of your chest or belly as you inhale and exhale. As you inhale, you may even want to visualize or imagine that you're inhaling a calm, peaceful energy. And with each exhale, visualizing or imagining that you're releasing any tension, stress, grief, fear, or anxiety that you've been holding on to. Begin by reflecting on the benefit of having a mind that has balance and equanimity. See if you can sense what a gift it can be to bring a peaceful heart to the world around you. Allow yourself to feel an inner sense of balance and ease.
Then begin repeating phrases such as, may I be balanced and at peace. And if you'd like, you can repeat the phrase in your own mind's eye after I say it. May I be balanced and at peace. Acknowledging that all created things arise and pass away. Joys, sorrows, pleasant events, people, buildings, animals, nations, even whole civilizations. Let yourself rest in the midst of them. I like to imagine myself like the kelp in the ocean while the waves crash over me or through me I glide back and forth may I learn to see the arising and passing of all nature with equanimity and balance Recognizing that all of nature arises and passes. Flowers, plants, animals and trees bloom and they grow and then they pass away. As do people, buildings, nations, even whole civilizations. May I be open and balanced and peaceful. May I be like the kelp in the ocean as these waves crash through me or over me or around me. As the waves, big and small, arise and recede. Acknowledge that all beings are heirs to their own karma and that their lives arise and pass away following the conditions and deeds created by them. While you can deeply love and care for others, in the end, their happiness and suffering depend on their thoughts and actions. To find equanimity with others, add this phrase, your happiness and suffering depend on your thoughts and actions and not my wishes for you. Perhaps calling someone to mind if there's a loved one that you wish you could be with or that you've watched suffering and it's been hard for you because you'd like to help them. Calling this person to mind now as you repeat this phrase, your happiness and suffering depend on your thoughts and actions and not my wishes for you. And in the next steps, you can wish peace and equanimity for specific people you know, and then to those beyond, individually or in groups, or to all of humanity, wishing, may you learn to see the arising and passing of all things with equanimity and balance. May you have true equanimity. May you be balanced and peaceful.
perhaps calling another person to mind, someone that you care about, wishing them well, wishing them equanimity, by imagining or saying to them in your mind's eye, may you learn to see the arising and passing of all things with equanimity and balance. May you have true equanimity. May you be balanced and peaceful. And then imagining all of the people who are here on this call with you right now today, or who might be watching the recording, connecting into this community of souls that's joined together to support each other, to feel a sense of calm and ease and peace during these difficult times. Wishing well for this community by saying to everyone who's here with you right now, may you learn to see the arising and passing of all things with equanimity and balance. May you have true equanimity. May you be balanced and peaceful. And finally, you can expand your own field of equanimity to the whole world, all of humanity, all of our planet by saying, may I bring compassion and equanimity to the events of the world. May I find balance and equanimity and peace amidst it all. May I find balance and equanimity and peace amidst it all. And sometimes I also like to pose the question, how can I be of service during this time? What is one kind or loving act, or one act of service that it would be useful for me to focus on at this time? Perhaps a neighbor's face comes to mind, someone you'd like to reach out to by leaving a kind note or bringing them a meal, offering to get them groceries. Perhaps there's someone in your immediate family that you wanna make sure that you give an extra loving hug or message to, or that you cultivate more patience with. Perhaps there's a positive piece of news or something joyful that you wanna share with a friend or with people on social media. Simply asking the question, hmm, how can I be of service at this time? How can I show up as love for myself, for my loved ones, for my colleagues at work, for my community, for the world? Now coming back into your body, starting to feel the support of the chair, the floor beneath you, perhaps noticing any noises inside the room or outside the room. As you're ready, allowing your eyes to gently open. I would love to hear from a couple of you what that experience, what that meditation was like. Have you done any equanimity practices before? How did that support you? What did you notice? 
So you can either type in the chat, or you can also just unmute yourselves directly to share. We've set this up as a Zoom meeting so that it can be a little more interactive and we can feel a sense of community and connection during this time. So if you wanna just type in the chat what that was like for you, or you can also unmute yourselves to share, I'd love to hear. Welcome Darlene from Simi Valley. So fun to see where everyone is joining us from. You can also go ahead and just introduce yourselves if you'd like. So was it easy to connect with this sense of balance and peace amidst everything that's happening in the world? Or was that difficult? So Polly just shared, it was a lovely practice. Jane said the meditation was like an invitation to come back. Thank you for sharing. I know when I first heard the term equanimity, I sort of didn't really know what it meant or how to cultivate it or practice it. And this meditation really, really has helped me do that. I, for me at least, I, I really, really love um, the one sentence, and I'm gonna put it in the chat because I use it all the time on myself. Here, I'm gonna type it in right now. This one sentence from Jack Cornfield's meditation, your happiness and suffering depend on your thoughts and actions and not my wishes for you. <sighs> that one really helps me when I see a loved one that's struggling, you know, maybe they're in a lot of fear and anxiety and they're kind of worked up and I, I wanna help them, but I also, I don't necessarily want to match their energy and meet them in the fear and the anxiety. And sometimes, I don't know about you all, I know I've done this to my loved ones. When I'm in a little bit of misery, I kind of want people to meet me there. I, by, I want them to show me that they love me by being as fearful or as anxious as I am. And if they stay in a joyful place, it can actually even piss me off sometimes. <laughs> like, hey, this is a big deal. You should be worried too. And so I love that, that one line from the equanimity practice because it really helps you refocus on, you can have well wishes for someone and yet also surrender the fact that they're in control of their thoughts and their actions, not you. So that, that one line really helps me to remember your happiness and suffering depend on your thoughts and actions and not my wishes for you. I love that because it holds space for me to have well wishes for them while at the same time letting me let go of the responsibility of someone else's happiness. So you can wish well for someone while also surrendering control and just acknowledging you never had control over their happiness in the first place. Okay, well, in addition to that um, lovely practice, I wanna give you all some of the, the tools, some of my favorite tools to cope with stress and fear and uncertainty and the difficulty that many people are feeling right now. And um, there's a couple things I wanna share. First of all, I just wanna share a story uh, about losing my marbles last week. So for any of you who are, are working parents with small children at home, that's me right now. My husband and I are both trying to work from home with two small kids, and it is crazy. And as some of you know, um, my mom has, was very ill and she actually transitioned to the spirit world last week. So I'm in the midst of some really deep grief and also some really profound gratitude and everything in between. And um, about, I don't know, 10 days ago or so, I had this day where I had been up, I, I, my kids were fighting over a toy and I, I was in my pajamas for 50 hours straight. <laughs> I didn't, I slept in them. I was in my pajamas all day. I slept in them again. And I never got out of my pajamas for like, I'm not kidding, like 55 hours. You know, I didn't change or shower and I was just, you know, dirty hair, everything. And my kids were screaming at each other and fighting over a toy. And I, I went in there and I just lost it and I ripped the toy out of their hands and I broke it. <laughs> I ripped it in half and was like, ah, oh, I can't handle this. I dropped it on the floor. They had like stunned, shocked faces. 
And I just screamed, I need a mommy timeout and ran to my bedroom, sobbed on my bed, had like an emotional release and ended up just deciding I needed to watch Netflix on my phone for a while and take a nap. And ha! Huh, afterwards, I was able to reflect back on that, that time period. And my sister and I joked, it was not, it was not a good day for me. Uh, but you know, what happened was I was up all night. Um, I didn't get much sleep because I was giving my mom morphine every few hours. So I was sleep deprived. I was under tremendous stress. I had a mother in hospice. I had, it was the first week we were homeschooling my, our children. My husband was starting a new job. This is all in the midst of COVID. So it was just a, a ton of pressure. And the thing I just wanted to share with all of you today is we're all going to lose it during this time. I mean, this is really big, what we're going through. And for some individually, it's different than others, but you know, everyone, this is really big for everyone. And I think um, just acknowledging the bigness of it and having compassion for yourself is so important. And I just wanted to name that, you know, it is hard. And um, for me in the past, when I lose my, my shit, you know, excuse me, I curse sometimes, I, I would have a tendency to beat myself up. And the thing that I feel like I've really been deepening into with my own mindfulness practice and spirituality and the tools that work for me is this just this sense of making room for all of, a, all of myself, for stepping into my wholeness. And even the parts of me that I'm not proud of, even the times when I show up in a really unwise way, how can I make space for those parts of myself? And how can I have compassion and just acknowledge that this is really hard, what I'm going through right now, and be kind to myself during this time? And so um, there's, there's a couple of actually really simple tools that I keep coming back to that really help me. And uh, I wanted to share some of them with you all today. The first one, it's from Brene Brown. It's so easy and yet it's really profound. It's just called writing yourself a permission slip. Some of you who've taken programs with me might have done this before. You really can't do this too often. So what you do is you just give yourself permission for something. Often what I found is we put these pressures and expectations on ourselves that we need to show up in a certain way or we need to keep it all together or I shouldn't be yelling at my kids or I should be more patient or I should be getting more work done every day, when really we're in a whole new paradigm right now. And, you know, it's really important to be able to give ourselves permission to mess up, to be human, to make mistakes, and to just be kind to ourselves. So one of the ways I like to do this is to write myself a literal permission slip, just like you would get when you were a kid and you were going on a field trip, you know, your mom would, or dad would write a permission slip saying, I give, you know, Vanessa permission to go on the field trip. So what I'd like for you to do right now is to get out a piece of paper and a pen. And I'd like for you to just, if you can tap into some of the stillness and the quiet from the meditation, that can be helpful. Just ask yourself, hmm, in what way am I, you know, being hard on myself right now or having unrealistic expectations of myself? And just see what comes to mind. And then what I'd like for you to do is write yourself a permission slip. So it's going to start with, I give myself permission. And you can even write your name if you want. Like, I, Vanessa Loader, give myself permission to, and just fill that in with whatever comes up for you. And you can write several if you want. So we're going to take a moment to write yourself a permission slip. I give myself permission to, I'm writing several. <laughs> I give myself permission to, and someone is to like to not have all the answers or to be a mess. Mm. 
once you've come up with one, please write it in the chat. It's so helpful to hear other people's. It'll inspire everyone and maybe give them ideas for their own permission slip. Um, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna read some of mine. I wrote, I give myself permission to fall apart. And, um, you know, Mark Lesser, who was one of our guests earlier in these bringing calm to COVID gatherings, I, at the time my mom was sick, she hadn't yet transitioned. And I said, well, I'm feeling really resourced and, you know, emotionally strong. And he said, he turned to me and said, well, don't confuse falling apart with not being strong. You know, make sure you, you give yourself permission to fall apart. And so that's been something I've been remembering to just let myself fall apart right now because I, I'm in the midst of some big stuff. So I give myself permission to fall apart. Oh, Molly, I love it. Molly said, I give myself permission to rest, capital R-E-S-T. And Ali said, I give myself permission to not work. Yes. Vanessa Jolet said, I give myself permission to not be on social networks while feeling more vulnerable. Love it. So good. Mila said, I give myself permission to not be perfect. Oh, Kathleen, I love this. I give myself permission to take the oxygen mask first. Yes. I also wrote, I give myself permission to barely work. <laughs> and this one was like, this one was scary for me to write, but I said, I give myself permission to be an absent parent. Um, as I've been grieving my mom's passing, my, my seven-year-old daughter in particular is really tuned into me and my energy. And she said, you're just not the same mommy since Grammy got sick. You're not the same and you're not here. And at first I was feeling really guilty, like, oh, I should be showing up for my daughter. And then I thought, it's okay. I can be a little bit emotionally absent right now. Um, and even though, you know, what happens when I say that is I feel a little guilt, like I shouldn't be an absent parent. But actually, maybe it's really good for me to be an absent parent, to take care of myself, my heart, to tend to my heart and my own pain and grief. And that is actually what's going to make me a better parent for her in the long run. So I'm giving myself permission to be an absent parent. Uh, and to, of course, and to not care about my house, cooking, cleaning. Psh, no. All right, there's some other really good ones here I love. Um, Jennifer said, I give myself permission to not accomplish big things right now. Oh, yes. I love that, Jennifer. I saw somewhere on social media, a person wrote, don't, you know, now that you're in quarantine, you don't have to like write that novel and make famous poetry or paint that painting you were always going to paint. In some ways, I think when we have this time in quarantine, many of us think, well, I should be using this time to work on those big creative projects or to do something special. But also that doesn't acknowledge like just the intensity of what we're all going through. So we don't need to like leverage this time in quarantine to do something special. You know, as one of my girlfriends said to me, she's like, Vanessa, don't judge yourself. Don't judge your husband. Just get through it. So there's something to be said for just getting through it right now. Tanya, I love this one too. She said, I give myself permission to let my kid on electronics without stressing. What else is he going to do while he's stuck inside? Uh, Rajan wrote, I give myself permission to say no when I, when I feel I want to, to whoever, whenever. Oh, such a good one. Katarina said, I give myself permission to not entertain the kids all day long and leave them with their devices for a long while. Wonderful. And Sharon said, I give myself permission to not check my list at the end of the day. Yay, Sharon. So good. So the other thing I want to share that I've noticed about myself um, since my mom passed and I'm coping with so much, it's like I'm finally giving myself the permission I always needed. So earlier this week, I think it was on Monday, I did, I was feeling pretty good. And so I did maybe two hours of work. And then I stopped and I watched the Downton Abbey movie um, on my couch in the middle of the afternoon. It felt like such a luxury. And I felt so much better afterwards. And I went on a walk by myself. And I, I was kind of laughing because I looked back on my day and I said, wow, like I got two hours of work done. That's amazing. That's so good for everything I'm going through right now. And it felt like, gee, do I need my mom to die in order to give myself the permission I really need to take care of myself? Like, is that how extreme things need to get before I will be kind to myself? 
it felt like like death and extreme horrible circumstances was like the only thing that allowed me to finally give myself permission to really take care of myself. And I just really noticed how kind of twisted that is. Um, and that I wish I could give myself more permission all the time, not just when things seem really horrendous. So I, and for all of us right now, things are very difficult in a lot of ways. And I, for me, I find when things are very difficult, I need to give myself even more permission, more permission to, to take care of myself and my needs. Oh, and Darlene said, I give myself permission to enjoy this Zoom series. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Polly said, I give myself permission to do what I have the energy for in the moment, even when that's Netflix. Yeah, that's a really good one, Polly. Oh, and I love what Lou just shared, something that you read this week. There is no right or wrong way to be at this time. Cut yourself some slack. <sighs> yes. And Catherine said, I give myself permission to go at my own pace. Mm. Really beautiful. Larry said, I give myself permission not to know. Yeah, there's so much uncertainty right now. And even for those of us who maybe feel like we're sort of adjusting to the new normal of shelter in place, there's still the question of like, well, will, when will things return to normal? When can I count on events or things coming back? And just giving yourself permission to not to not know, to be scared, to be stuck. That's a good one too, to give yourself permission to be scared or to be stuck. Lisa said, I give myself permission to focus on my own healing work first before serving and prioritizing others. Oxygen mask. Right now, things are taking more time, homeschooling kids, etc., and many to-dos have had to be paused or dropped altogether for now. Yeah, that's a beautiful awareness, Lisa. The other thing that's helped me is to think about my values and how family is one of my core values. And I think about, you know, my children and how they're feeling the effects of all of this as well. And the more I can be a grounding force for them and by taking care of myself and showing up in a grounded and calm way for them, that supports our whole family system. So yeah, permission slips are fabulous. Um, and the other thing, Again, this is really simple, but that, that has helped me is I ended up kind of writing two columns on a piece of paper. And on one end I wrote, what is helping me cope right now? So you can do this right now if you'd like as well. What is helping me cope? And what is not helping me cope? And, you know, to get my answers, I looked to some really a hard time. So the day I had my biggest meltdown when I broke my kid's toy, Oh, and by the way, my daughter locked herself in a room and wrote a note that said, mommy is the worst mommy ever, and then slid it under the crack of the door as I'm like sobbing and my mom's dying and like COVID. It was, so anyway, <laughs> but what I did is I, I looked back and I said, okay, like what was leading up to that moment that caused me to crack? I mean, and some of those things are obviously completely out of control, like my mom being really sick and COVID. But for example, one of the things was sleep. I did not get good sleep the night before I had that big meltdown. And you know, this, that one I think should, could go in everyone's column on what helps you cope and feel resourced. Sleep is one of the most important things. So if you're not getting good sleep, you're not gonna be resourced to handle the difficulty that you might be experiencing. And again, it's so simple. And that night, you know, there wasn't much I could have done to get more sleep because I was taking care of my mom. But what I wish I had done maybe in the morning is recognize like, I'm going to be more poorly resourced today because I just had a really bad night's sleep. Therefore, like, how soon can I get a nap? What can I take off my plate? You know, I'm going to need more support today because I didn't get a good night's sleep. So sleep helps me cope. And that one helps everyone cope. And just thinking about like for me right now, I feel like it's so intense what I'm going through with my mom having transitioned and all of this. And even if I take 10 or 15 minutes and I just walk outside by myself, I'm, I feel better immediately. And a couple of times I've wanted to call a friend on that walk and that's helped me cope. 
Other times I just want silence. Um, watching Downton Abbey, the movie, on my couch actually really helps me cope. So I invite you to just write down what are some of the things that help you cope? You know, for me, being in nature, being alone in quiet, um, calling a friend. Maybe it's listening to good music. So just make a list of some of the things that help you cope. What are your coping strategies? And again, if you want to share some in the chat, it can inspire all of us. And then in the other column, so I have like really bad handwriting, but I just draw a line down the middle of the page. And in the other column, I'd like you to just notice some of the things that you might be doing that are not helping you cope. So for many of us, that might be watching the news a little too obsessively or too much time on Instagram or social media. Or you could also write some of your coping strategies that are not as, as useful. You know, maybe drinking alcohol or, you know, going unconscious. We all have different addictive tendencies. So some of those things we might think help us cope and then they, they actually don't. Like for me, I've been eating sugar and that's one that, you know, I'm cutting myself some slack, it's fine, but it doesn't restore me as much as the other things. So what are some of the things you might be tempted to do to cope that don't really serve you? And can you just be honest with yourself about that? And again, this is with kindness and compassion. It's not about shaming yourself. We all have some unhealthy coping strategies, that's okay. But like for me, for example, I'm noticing if I watch more than like three hours of TV in a day, it actually starts to feel like it's, I'm feeling blah. So there's almost like a, a limit at which it's, it turns and it's not really helping me anymore. So just observing your own patterns. Yeah, Beata wrote too much coffee. Vanessa wrote, judging myself while feeling in difficulty is not helping. Mm -hmm. And Ali wrote, going out for a walk when it's sunny helps. Not help, not going out at all for fresh air the whole week. I know, right? And these are the things where it seems so obvious. Like, oh, I need to go out and get fresh air every single day. And yet we forget. You can get kind of in your, like, it's like we get blinders on and we forget the very simple things that really help us. And again, it can only, it can be just 10 minutes and it can be so useful. Okay, so I know we have about 15 more minutes till Dr. Shafali joins us. And there's one other practice that I wanna share with you all that I know Jennifer and some of the women who've taken my programs will be familiar with, um, but it, it's one of my favorites. And I actually ended up doing it to myself last night for like 20 minutes and I felt so much better afterwards. And the, the origin of this practice comes from Katie Hendricks, who was one of our teachers earlier for the um, Bringing Calm to COVID gatherings. And she likes to say, um, I, she got this quote from someone else, I'll, I'll dig up who it's from, but that all of our feelings come from the same faucet. So when you try to clamp down on your fear or your grief or your anxiety, and you try to push those uncomfortable feelings down, we actually then are also blocking our ability to feel joy and calm and peace and ease and ecstatic, you know, happiness. Because all feelings come from the same faucet. And so one of the things that's really useful in difficult circumstances is to find ways to be with your uncomfortable emotions. And last night I was sitting on my daughter's bed and I thought, maybe I want to drink some alcohol or eat a gummy worm. You know, we have marijuana is legal here in California. And I was like, do I want to eat like a weed gummy right now? And then I thought, okay, I'm trying to go to some, go unconscious. Those are like unhelpful coping strategies. What are the feelings that I'm running away from right now that I don't want to feel? I just, that was the only question I asked myself. What feelings am I trying to run away with, with sugar or alcohol that I don't want to feel? And as I asked that question, I just burst into tears, you know, and was really upset about my mom's passing. And 
Um, and then later that night, after my kids were in bed and I had some space, I came back to this practice that I want to share with you all. And um, I was having some other really uncomfortable feelings in addition to the grief. I got like jealous of a business thing, which seems like really inappropriate timing. Why do I even care about that? And I was just feeling this like weird jealousy of someone else's success. And then I was hating myself. And, and I did this practice and it was so healing. So what it's, I call it befriend your feelings. And it's a way for you to make space for all the parts of you, even the ugly ones, even the parts of your humanity that you wish weren't there, even your most horrible thoughts or your most horrible behavior. And it's a way to be with those feelings um, without letting them overtake you and to make space for them. And here's the tricky thing. It's kind of a paradox because it's sort of our human nature to want to run away from discomfort and from like these uncomfortable feelings like fear and grief and sadness. And yet what you resist persists. So the more that you push them away, the more they stick around. And when you can allow yourself to feel some of these really gnarly feelings, that is actually what frees you and what releases them and helps you come back into joy or groundedness or calm or peace and ease. So we're just gonna do that practice right now. So what I'd like for you to do is again, allow your eyes to gently close and hopefully you're still in a comfortable seated position. <sighs> and I'd like for you to just notice what feeling you've most been wanting to avoid or to run away from, or what, what sort of emotion that you might label as negative um, feels the most alive for you today. So that might be anxiety, it might be fear, sadness, maybe really profound grief, and just Allow that emotion to identify itself. Maybe there's something that you've been worrying about so much, so it just feels like you've been stuck in this worry cycle and there's all this worry and you don't know what to do with it. And now what I'd like for you to do is visualize or imagine a beautiful place in nature and it's helpful to imagine a bench or a swing. So you could just imagine a beautiful park bench, perhaps, you know, on a, on a gently sloping hill of grass, or maybe it's overlooking the ocean, or maybe it's a porch swing on a beautiful white veranda. So just imagine a bench or a swing somewhere outdoor in nature that feels very peaceful to you. And what I'd like for you to do is to imagine or visualize or sense any way you can that difficult emotion sitting on the bench or on the swing next to you. So you might see it as a blob. Just notice what shape it is as you put that, that fear or that anxiety, that sadness, that worry, that grief, whatever it is, put it next to you on the bench and notice if it has a shape to it or a texture. Notice if it has a color. Perhaps it's an angry red prickly blob or maybe it's a tiny little blue or green sad little creature. Just allow your imagination to run with it, to see whatever shows up for you today. As you visualize or imagine that feeling sitting next to you on the bench or on the porch swing. And even though you may feel some sort of repulsion towards it or feel like it even perhaps wants to hurt you, take a moment and see if you can just welcome it just a little bit and let it know, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here and I welcome you here. There's space for you here. 
You are a part of me. And I welcome you. And then perhaps reaching your hand out to hold its hand or putting your arm around it. Just befriending it just a little bit as you sit quietly on this bench or this porch swing. And as you befriend it, as you let it know that it's welcome here, it may even change shape or color or texture. It may soften a little, or it may not. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Simply sitting here welcoming that feeling, letting it know that you're here and befriending it just a little bit. And then if you'd like, you can turn to it and ask it, what do you need from me? What do you need from me? It might want to feel loved, it might want a hug, it might want to feel accepted just the way it is. And perhaps you can even validate it because it's showing up for you from a place of love. Its intention is to help you or protect you from something. And perhaps you don't like its actions or how it makes you feel. But can you recognize that it's here in service of you? It wants to help you. It wants to support you. Even if its behavior or its actions haven't been helpful. Its intentions are good. And it just wants you to see it or love it or accept it the way that it is. So see if you can make space for this feeling befriending it a little bit and notice how it reacts or responds. Take a moment to give it whatever it asks for from you. Giving it a hug or telling it you love it. I like to create a little space in my heart center for these difficult emotions or feelings. And I tell them that there's a room just for them in my heart. And I pick them up and if I need to, I shrink them down so they can fit inside my heart. And I create a little space just for them. And I tell them there will always be room for them in my heart. And I leave them in this special space in my heart. So if that works for you, you can do that. Or you can follow your own intuition with whatever would most support you in welcoming and befriending that feeling now. Maybe that feeling wants you to go play with them or fly a kite or do some silly or fun activity together. Whatever it is, let your imagination just go with it. Don't judge it. There's no right or wrong way to experience this. Simply allowing, accepting, befriending this difficult emotion. And now bringing this to completion, saying any final words to this 
emotion or this feeling that you're befriending. Letting it know that you love it or that it's welcome here. And then as you're ready, coming back to your body, again, feeling the support of the chair, the floor beneath you, and allowing your eyes to gently open. Oh, and I'd love to hear from some of you what that experience was like. You can share in the chat um, or unmute yourselves. And I'll just share a brief story. So last night, uh, I'm gonna be leading this webinar for a big group of female CFOs. And you know, I saw a former colleague of mine had just led a webinar for them. And she and I co-created all this content together. And I was like, oh my gosh, what if she already taught what I'm gonna teach? I can't believe they already hired her and I'm gonna be the next one. And, I went into these crazy stories of competition and jealousy and judgment and I, oh, it felt horrible. And then I did the befriend your feelings exercise and I had three little blobs with me on the bench. And one of them was green, she was jealousy. One was red with like a long hooked nose and she was, oh, she was gnarly. She was angry and she just wanted to squash other people who are doing the same work I'm doing. She was like, I don't want anybody else's videos to get any views on YouTube and I wanna, it's horrible. You know, here I am, I'm like some mindfulness spiritual teacher and I want like other people to fail. I mean, it's, it was it's the most like gnarly side of my humanity in a lot of ways. And it, it feels like opposite to so many things I believe in and stand for. But there it was, it was an emotion I was having. And then the third one, she felt like really superior to other people. It was a big blob. And then it shrunk into a tiny blob who also felt really inferior. And it was the same blob, both feeling inferior and superior, you know, trying to make itself better than or less than other people by comparing myself to other wisdom teachers. And, and uh, long story short, it ended up connecting to this beautiful healing with my mother who just transitioned because unknowingly she always did this to me and my sister like one was the good one and one was the bad one and, and so my sister and I were kind of set up for this really unhealthy competition our whole lives and I ended up just having this sadness and grief come out and all these things um, but basically I made space for all of those feelings on the bench and all three blobs the different shapes and colors and personalities that they had and I welcomed them back into my wholeness and just accepted that right now, these are part of my humanity. And hating myself for having these feelings or shaming myself, it, make, it just makes it worse. And so what I invite you to do is just recognize, become aware of the truth of your difficult emotions and see if you can just make a little space in your heart for them, whatever they are. Um, and then today when I was leading you all, I saw the same three blobs of mine but instead they wanted to fly a kite together. <laughs> so we ended up, like I was singing the song from Mary Poppins. It's like, let's go fly a kite. And we went off and flew a kite together. Um, and so it sounds silly and weird and crazy, but it's one of the best practices I've found to make space for some of your difficult emotions and to start to welcome all of the parts of you in coming back into wholeness. So um, I'd love, and it is, Rajan just said, it's, um, it sounds like experiencing unconditional love towards yourself. Yes, this is so true. And then you ask the question, can you have a close friend be part of your acceptance process to all aspects of you? Does it work just as well? So I'm curious if you could answer me, do you mean um, imagining a close friend rather than yourself on the bench? Or are you talking about actually having a conversation with a close friend in real life around like, oh, these are the parts of myself I'm not feeling good about. And with someone in real life. Okay, great. So I would imagine, um, I would, first of all, I personally believe we are all our own best authority and that your intuition is gonna guide you for what's best for you. So if that's what you're feeling called to do, I would, I would trust myself and do it. Um, in terms of like global advice for everyone, I would say it would really depend on the friend um, because this, these are very vulnerable emotions and very, they can be very raw. And so you would want to make sure that you share it with someone who really can respond with unconditional love. Because if you were to share it with someone 
who were to respond with some level of judgment, that would feel, that would not feel good at all. And so it would really depend on, um, you know, how the friend might respond to that. And that's why I like doing it as a visualization because you, you can guarantee unconditional love for yourself. You, you can't guarantee how someone else might respond or react. That being said, one of the things Brene Brown shares is that one of the best ways to heal shame is to speak it, to speak it out loud. So there can be tremendous healing in sharing some of your shame or some of the parts of you that you're not feeling proud of with someone who can respond in a loving and supportive way. So yeah, I would say trust yourself on that. Um, so Aaron shared, I just love this. Sitting on a porch swing is one of the most soothing things ever. I agree, Aaron. And uh, someone else said, I can't help but think of the Pixar movie Inside Out. Yes, that movie is really wonderful, Kathleen. And I've done this technique with a lot of different clients and people have all kinds of things. One person had little like M&M people show up, you know, like the cartoon M&Ms with the stick legs. So other people have had something that's so scary it wants to like destroy them or eat them. I've had that happen as well. And you can actually surrender to it and, and let it destroy you and see where it goes after that. See how it morphs and changes. So I recommend you play around with this technique in whatever way um, serves you. And we'll share a link with the recording with that guided meditation if you all wanna try doing this again on your own.